Hello everyone, Chaos here and welcome to another old school RuneScape video. If you scroll through YouTube, you might find a ton of videos talking about the mid game. How to escape the mid game, mid game bosses, mid game money makers, mid game goals, and the list goes on. I have made one of these myself in the past and instead of recycling it, I thought why not go a step further and this time go over how to escape the late game in OSRS so you can start making some goals as soon as you can. Boys and girls, if you enjoyed today's video, I'm giving my puppy one kiss and a new toy for every new subscription and a like on this video, as we're aiming for 100k by the end of 2024. You can also join our Discord with the link in the description. Part of the inspiration for this video comes from the Sailing Poll Results Summary. But why such a specific blog? In there, Jagex shows the number of votes, but distributed among accounts at different stages of the game. I honestly thought that the majority of the player base was in the mid-game at around 16 or up to 1800 total level, but to my surprise, nearly 60,000 voters are between 18 and the 2100 total level, which in my honest opinion puts them in the category of late game. That is why this time around, apart from making a video for our mid-level brothers and sisters, we are taking a look at how to escape the late game and call yourself an end game giga chad. So ladies and gentlemen, let's jump right in. Before going over the 9 things you should be doing or aiming for to graduate to the end game, I want to go over a little recap of my previous video, just so we are all on the same page as to what the difference is between jumping from the mid to the late game and the jumping from the late to the end game. Up first we have scaling outfits. You definitely don't need all of them, but it would be a good idea to grind it towards a few of them through their activity if it's something you needed to do on your way to 99, like Pyromancer and the Prospector. Next we have Bearer's Gloves to have a great item for all three combat styles, and then unlocking as many teleportation methods through construction and questing, so you can get around the game much quicker. And speaking of, I touched on questing, more specifically Grandmaster quests, since the prerequisite quest needed will open up a ton of areas in the map. One of my favorite ones was telling you to unlock as many untradeable pieces of gear such as the Arc Light, Imbued God Capes, Office Assembler, and avoid just to mention a few. That way, you don't need to worry too much about expensive upgrades. This was followed by having an efficient POH with a ton of utility like a pool and a portal nexus. We also talked about money making to maintain a bond every 14 days if you don't want to pay $13 a month. Being able to afford late game gear or at least the powerful weapons for each combat style, getting yourself a few elite achievement diaries, and most importantly unlocking the end game training methods to start working towards 99. Now that I look at it, I think this last one is a little bit too steep even for the late game, so we will go over this one again during this video. So now that we know what I consider goals to escape the mid game, let's level up. The very first thing you should consider getting to start dipping your toes into the end game is achieving a trimmed music cape. But why such a specific item? Well, in my very personal opinion, I consider the trimmed music cape a pseudo-completionist cape in terms of lore and content that this game has to offer. If you think about it, to achieve and being able to wear a trimmed music cape, you need two things. Every single sound track in Old School RuneScape, including holiday tracks, and the Achievement Diary cape. And what do you need to obtain and wear the Achievement Diary cape? Well, thanks to the Elite Lumbridge Diary, you need the quest cape to go along with it. Not only does the music cape take several months to achieve, or only a few if you're speedrunning the game, but the trimmed version of this item is, if I recall correctly, the only time-locked item in the entire game. As I said before, to be able to trim it, you need every single track including holiday music. This means that when you make your account, you will have to wait an entire year to unlock music from events such as the OSRS birthday event, April Fools, Easter, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and finally Christmas. Now, the music cape is not only a big flex, but it's actually an extremely niche but convenient item to have for your elite and master clue steps. By using the built-in teleport, it will take you to Fallow, who is located south of Relica and to north of Seer's village. The cape puts you just the three tiles away from him, and if you're looking to camp either a tier of clue scroll, this item is a must-have for your setup. And honestly, a pretty cool one because of the colors and the air guitar emote. And speaking of clue scrolls, I will now take a few moments to talk about one of my favorite activities in the entire game. Now, of course, you can do beginner, easy, medium, and even hard clues with barely any requirements. Hard clues are the only ones I have mentioned so far that require just a little bit of combat by fighting Ceredomen and Zamorak wizards. Other than some basic quests and items that are really easy to obtain, these are not that much of a challenge. This is not the case for Elite and Master Clue Scrolls. And very quickly, I just have to mention this in one of my videos, for the love of god, please, please, please do not do Elite Clue Scrolls, as it's much better to hand them it to Watson to give you a Master Clue Scroll instead. 
I would personally only do elites if I already have the Bloodhound and the green log the entire Master Clue segment. Anyway, ranting aside, these two tiers of clues actually have some pretty difficult challenges coming from Sherlock, Watson, and the Fallow, and some that require even the higher levels and some achievement diaries. You are seeing them on screen right now, and if you want to avoid dropping a master clue because of these levels, I highly recommend getting all of them before embarking in a 10 to 20 minute adventure that will yield 100k. The table doesn't show it, but another example is that to make it to the VLD cave step faster, there's a level 91 agility requirement for you to use a long rope and avoiding all of the rocks on your way down. I cannot stress this enough, if you want to consider yourself an endgame player, that means none of these levels will be an obstacle between you and that 1 in 1000 chance at obtaining that beautiful Bloodhound pet. This seems like the perfect transition to talk about unlocking endgame training methods, which like I said before, seems like a pretty steep requirement to escape the mid-game. So I will talk about it in greater detail right now. First of all, what do I mean by endgame training methods? Well, simply put, being at a level in a certain skill, so you can train with whatever you want, of course if XP per hour makes sense. I am also going to list what I consider are said endgame training methods on screen, and we have options such as 94 magic for Ice Barrage in the Monkey Madness 2 caves, 95 runecrafting for Wrath Runes, 92 agility for the 5th floor in the Hallowed Sepulchre, 95 thieving to avoid failing Arty Knights, 84 crafting for Black Dragon Hide bodies, and the list goes on. I want to specify that when I say being able to do everything this skill has to offer, I'm not talking about, for example, level 98 crafting at which you can make Zenite amulets. Of course I know you are not going to be training by cutting Zenite jewelry because that would be a little demented. But I mean being able to do whatever you want to achieve great experience rates depending on how much money you are investing in the skill of your choice. Melee and ranged are a little different since you can train pretty efficiently with a wide assortment of weapons, and experience per hour is not going to change dramatically. I mean, sure, if you go to the Nightmare Zone with a Whip versus a Soul Reaper Axe, you will see a decent jump, but in terms of casual training to Slayer, you're not really going to need to be able to wear a Scythe, a Twisted Bow, or a Tumican Shadow to level up your combat skills super efficiently. Always remember that to, you have to do what's enjoyable to you, and things you can do for an extended period of time without wishing to low alk yourself. Man, I'm pretty on point with transitions in this video, because up next we are going to talk about combat and PBM more specifically solo bosses, as raids will make an appearance later on. I plan on making another video on bosses you should be practicing to get into endgame PVM, but for now I will give you a very small sneak peek at what that video is going to be about. And we will go over a few encounters I think will make you a much better player. First of all, we all know that 99 Slayer might not get you far in terms of PVM prowess, especially if you don't engage with a lot of powerful monsters. Things you should take a look at before considering yourself an endgame player are skills like movement, reaction time, gear switches, prayer switches, and even small things like the use of F keys to navigate your menu with your keyboard to save on precious clicks. A few things you should definitely look into being able to complete without breaking a sweat are Desert Treasure to Bosses, The Corrupted Gauntlet, and more recently I've been getting into the Fosani's Nightmare, which let me tell you, at one point it felt even more difficult than Awakened Bosses since the entire fight from start to finish is an absolute hellhole, compared to Awakened bosses which most of their difficulty comes towards the end in the Enraged phase. Being comfortable with some of the most difficult solo challenges in the game will definitely give you the confidence you need to start getting into the big boy raids. Although, now that I think about it, the Nightmare could be even more difficult than even a 150 invocation raid in the Tombs of Amaskun. Well hey, maybe it's because I can do TOA literally in my sleep. I don't think any of my videos have had transitions like this pretty much ever, because up next we are going to talk about raids, both solo and in a group. If doing any of the previous solo encounter gives you a boost in confidence when it comes to your PVM abilities, there's no better feeling than going on raids with your friends and being able to be the one to carry, which is exactly what we are going to talk about. Raid difficulty is mostly subjective, but if you watched my latest bossing ladder video, I have a pretty decent road to the most difficult challenges in the entire game. In there, you will see the order of difficulty I personally think raids should be approached. I know we're talking about endgame here, which means the highest difficulty setting, but let's quickly touch on how to get there first. Entry mode and normal TOA is definitely the easiest raid encounter you will be able to do, either solo or with your friends. This is followed by entry mode TOB, which I personally consider harder than the previous ones, simply because I have done TOA a lot more. Once you're comfy with these, Chambers of Zarek is your next step since we have a lot more bosses to learn, leading up to the big lizard at the end. 
followed by Expert TOA, the Theater of Blood, Challenge Mode Chambers, and the Hard Mode TOB being the ultimate raiding challenge. A lot of the difficulty of the last few raids on the list comes from gear check, as taking items such as Void and the Tier 75 weapons is not going to do well at all in these adventures, and the people might not even want you on their team. If you want to get into the end game of PVM OSRS has to offer, Expert TOA, Challenge Mode Chambers, and the Hard Mode TOB are exactly what you should be aiming for. Okay, okay, I will stop flexing my transitions, but up next we have something that goes hand in hand with being able to do all of these mechanically demanding challenges, and that is of course having the correct gear for them. More specifically, the incredibly expensive Mega Weapons. If you're an absolute gamer, you can do the aforementioned raids with gear that doesn't include a billion GP items. And something I consider you should have to move on to the end game of old school RuneScape is having one or two mega weapons for you to do insane damage. Now, I'm not saying all three mega weapons being the Scythe of Vitur, the Twisted Bow, and the Tumican Shadow, because depending on what activity you want to focus on, chances are you don't need all three of them, especially if you're just getting comfortable with all of them. I mean, sure, it's nice for the highest damage output, but if you look at it, you can do fine the Chambers with a Twisted Bow, at TOB with a Scythe, and the Tombs of a Mascot with a Shadow. When you start making more money, you can get a second mega weapon that goes well with the other gear. I would say a Scythe for Chambers, a Tebow for Tombs of a Mascot, and for TOB you might only need the Twisted Bow for Zarpus if you're getting started. Realistically speaking though, you can't call yourself an endgame PVMer if you don't have at least a mega weapon, or maybe two with a decent gear to go along with it. Or maybe you do, as I always say I'm not your father, so of course make sure to manage expectations when you gear up for raid. In my previous video I mentioned how it would be a not so terrible mistake if you ignore combat achievements since the rewards are great. This time around, endgame players definitely have a lot to work with when it comes to the many challenges pretty much every boss in the game has to offer. When we're talking about escaping the late game, I would consider the elite tier of combat achievements a hard requirement. You will need to get tons of points from many bosses in the game that will naturally make you a much better player, and of course those rewards in the Elite tier are great compared to the time needed to achieve this tier. You get 5% increased to Clue Scroll drop rates from all sources excluding Impling Jars, 3 daily teleports to Moral Wreck in case you start attempting the Inferno, or to go there for your Slayer tasks if you already have an Infernal Cape. Ecumenical Keys drop more often in the Wilderness God Wars Dungeon, 60 Cannonballs for your Cannon, and a 10% chance for Slaughter and Expeditious Bracelets to regenerate once you use the last to charge to save up on a few GP. The Master Tier rewards are even more cracked and a great incentive to start grinding towards them when the Elite Tier feels too newbie for a Giga Chat like you. Two of my favorite ones are 50% longer thrall duration and the two Jad or Zog tasks in case you get a Tazar task. Just to the elite tier of combat achievements might take a little bit longer than the quest cape or achievement diary cape to mention a few. But this is definitely an obvious choice for you to consider yourself an endgame player to gain more confidence when you eventually start working on that vampiric or Zuck helmet. And speaking of Zuck, the last thing on your list that will 100% turn you into an endgame player granted you check a lot of other things on the list is getting the incredibly prestigious Infernal Cape. I say prestigious because even after tons of power creep introduced into the game like Masori and Virtus, for me, a legit Infernal Cape will always be one of the biggest flexes in the entire game. Yes, even with just this year. The process of you learning the Inferno and the, all of its intricate waves and spawn system is without a shadow of a doubt one of the scariest things to do in the entire game. I say this because at the time of making this video, I still have 4 Infernal Capes and I'm pretty sure I cannot do an Inferno with a 100% success rate. When I get a Slayer task I will always try to do it, but this is still one of the few things in the game I can say with extreme certainty that I don't know if I will be able to complete it yet. I mean, if you look at it this way, there's absolutely no NPC like the Inferno Blobs and you will have to learn them purely through grinding the Inferno. I really hope Jagex introduces a mechanic like this in future PVM content, like the Fortis Colosseum. Because one of the biggest question marks I still have is that there's nothing to teach you blob mechanics, and once you master it, it doesn't really work anywhere else. Despite the Desert Treasure to bosses being added, and the Awakened Leviathan considered a harder challenge than Zuck himself, which I totally agree with, the 69 Waves of the Inferno have proven time and time again that if you own an Infernal Cape, you are definitely a great player worthy to be called an endgame Giga Chad. I have an extra one towards the end being cosmetic items you can get through raids, and I have them here because while it could be considered endgame and give you even more bragging rights, these items are purely cosmetic and it just means you are able to do set content pretty consistently. 
Some of these may not be as impressive as other things we have talked about, but for other players it may be the pinnacle of raids in OSRS. The Ancestral Ornament Kits coming from Challenge Mode Chambers, the Sanguine and Holy Ornament Kits coming from Hard Mode the Theater of Blood, and the Masori Crafting Kit, Menafite Ornament Kit, and the Cursed Phalanx, all coming from a Deathless 350, 425, and 500 Invocation Raid in Tombs of Amaskud, respectively. I only have the TOA ones, and so far just one Ancestral Ornament Kit. Seeing the Sanguine Scythe, it definitely gets my hopes up, so one day I am good enough at the Theater of Blood to own one of these bad boys. I really hope this continues to be the standard of PVM drops in Old School RuneScape, giving us visual changes to some of the best items in the game, as long as we can prove that we are good enough to own them. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the video, thank you so much for coming and for making it this far. If you did, let me know what you personally consider being an endgame player and why. If you include the term RSN in your comment, you will be entered in our weekly bond giveaway for which I will draw a winner on Friday's stream and contact you through your comment. I want to take a few seconds to thank the wonderful people that have decided to toss a few dollars my way to feed my family with tacos in a third world country. If you want to be part of this list of champions, click the join button below to see all of the cool perks you can get in the channel for your monetary pledge. In the next one, we will go over one of the most convoluted bosses I have ever done in the game, and tell you how to dispose of the Valsani's Nightmare in quick fashion. For now, I hope you have an amazing day, have an amazing week, and I will see you then. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Peace.